Welcome. This is PHY 2049L for the laboratory and it's called the fine beam tube lab. It's a dry lab because I guess um, we can't be face to face in the laboratory today. And so this is the next best thing. Um, so this is what the apparatus looks like. This is actually our apparatus. Um, the heart of it <clears throat> is this glass bulb and that contains low pressure uh, helium. <laughs> and the idea behind that is that um, just like a neon bulb glows when you energize the gas, so the electron beam passing through the gas will glow where the electron beam travels. So you can see where the electron beam is. It's the most amazing thing. And um, so we need an electron gun. The electron gun is this metal bit here. We'll get a better, a better visualization of it later. So this is the electron gun. And it's basically just a filament. And then there's some kind of uh, accelerating mechanism to give it uh, energy. And then you have some kind of collimator to make sure that the beam comes out reasonably straight. So we have electrons being emitted from the filament, just like in a normal light bulb. Then you accelerate them like crazy by having a big voltage between here. And then you collimate them. So that's what's going on with that. Um, then the uh, uh, next bit to pay attention to are these two copper colored things. And these are helm, Holtz pair. There's various configurations of electromagnet, and so we use the next best thing, which is a Helmholtz pair. There's a very specific ratio between the diameter of the coils and the separation between them. It works very nice. There's a quite uniform beam in here, but it's also we can you can see we can get into into the thing. And then down here we have the controller. Oh, sorry, I've got one more thing inside here. So what's going to happen is the electrons are going to come out and they're going to be bent by the magnet. And they're going to go in a circle. But what we put is we put a quartz glass ruler in its way. And so we see the numbers here. And these are the numbers of the diameter. This is the ruler. We see the numbers light up. So we have the numbers here and we, we can tell what the diameter of the circle is that the electrons go through by looking at that ruler. It's very clever. Back in the day, I had to put a ruler at the front and the ruler at the back and use parallax to actually get the true measurement of the path. Now they put the ruler inside and it makes this lab much speedier, much, much easier. And there's wires and all that. Don't worry about those. The wires come from the controller. And one of these is the voltage and the other one is the current. And when people first begin, they think, oh, that's the voltage of the beam and that's the current of the beam. And that's not true. It's the voltage of the beam. And it's the current in the magnet. Those are the two things that you control. You can, you can control the current in the magnet uh, and you can control the voltage of the beam. And if you make the current stronger, the magnetism gets stronger and so the, the circle the electrons go through is, is smaller. And if you make the beam voltage bigger, then the electrons have more energy so they want to go in a straight line more. And so the beam gets the circle gets bigger. So, so that's our basic system. This is showing this in a bit more detail, and I think you can see, you know, that ruler is quite well defined. And here's the electron gone, and uh, um, they're the two bits we're going to look at. We can put a hood over this thing to make it so that even in a darkened room, we can make it darker, so we really see what's going on. But if this thing is really well aligned, when the electrons come out, they actually make the number six, for example, will glow. So you know, oh, my beam is on six centimeters diameter. It's really a very clever technique.
very clever device. So these need to go into your book. And this is lab, I think it's lab 10, but it depends on the semester. And this is called a fine beam tube. And of course you need the date and you need the page number somewhere. And then what we're going to do today, remember we're writing into our log book so we can be quite informal. We have our objective. Our objective today is today we measure the charge to mass ratio of an electron using the fine beam tube method. And remember, we're writing for peers. We're writing for other people doing this course. So we don't need to explain. We're not writing a lab manual. We don't need to explain things that don't need to be explained. We compare our experimental value with the accepted value of 1.76 times 10 to the 11 coulombs per kilogram. Now what about our setup? We need to do a diagram for our setup, but it doesn't have to be picturesque diagram. It can be a schematic diagram. So I say the first thing we need to do is let's start with the with the let's start with the whoa. Let's start with a bulb. It doesn't need to be perfectly round. And this is the glass bulb filled with low pressure helium. And then we have a, this here is our electron gone fires out a stream of electrons and then inside here let's have a ruler and then let's do the outsides let's do a different color just to get us going so I have I'm, I'm kind of writing this freehand and it's you know it's it's always a little bit harder with a pen than it is with a with a paper and pencil. But so this is a Helmholtz pair electromagnet. That's like electro magnet. That's Cool. And the electrons will come out of here and go something like that. Now let's just be be clear about this. Uh, let's imagine the point where it hits the ruler. Okay, so at the point where it hits the ruler, then my electron is traveling upwards, which is like a uh, a positive charge traveling downwards so that would be my velocity and 
my force, of course, it's a centripetal force. I don't like using the word centripetal force because if you're in my class, you know that I prefer to talk about a centripetal acceleration. Um, there's a, a centripetal acceleration towards the middle of the circle. And I pay for that centripetal acceleration by having a magnetic force. So my magnetic force, which goes with my magnetic field, uh, no, my magnetic force is in that direction. And my magnetic field must be at 90 degrees to these things because, well, the equation is F B is equal to Q, the charge, times the velocity crossed with the magnetic field strength vector. So there's my fundamental equation. And so V cross B gives me an F. And so if my V is pointing down and I want a B to the uh, F to the right hand side, I want my B to go into the page. So these things are at 90 degrees to each other. So V cross B, you, you angle your fingers down in the V and then you curl them towards the B and the thumb points in the direction of the force. So we make these Helmholtz coil orientated so that the B is going into the page. And then the equipment is set up nicely. Okay. Um, okay. Let's do some theory. Theory. And this is basically uh, Newton's second law problem. We have a particle and it's got a certain velocity and there's a centripetal acceleration and I say oh the sum of the forces horizontally is equal to ma which equals mac which equals m v squared over r. That's from, you know, physics one. And then we say, okay, well, what is the horizontal force? And uh, the horizontal force is fb. So we say uh, fb which equals q velocity crossed with magnetic field strength equals whoops missed the m mv squared over r um it's wonderful that we made v perpendicular to b because of course the magnitude is equal to the magnitude of Q times the magnitude of V times the magnitude of the field strength times the sine of the angle between them. And because that's 90 degrees, 90 degrees between V and B, that's one, which equals M V squared over R. Let us rearrange. So we get Q over M, which is what I want. Q over M is equal to, well, let's just write it out. Q over M is going to equal V squared over R from the other side. Took that Q, took that, uh, um, took that M down here. I take that V at the bottom and that B at the bottom. So I get V over RB, okay. So, 
oh, these velocity of the electron, and I don't know what the velocity of the electron is. I know what R is, I can measure that. I know what B is, I can work that out. V, the velocity of an electron, I can't even see the electron. So I have a bit of an issue. I need a, an additional approach that will get me that velocity. And there is. There's the energy in electron volts. Oh, I've got to be careful with these volt V's. Big V, Vulcan V, you know, is is voltage and little curly V is velocity. I've got to be careful with my handwriting. So E V equals one half M little V squared. Well, I'm using Q for my E, so Q times the velocity V is equal to one half M V squared. And so we can say that, hmm, let's say V squared is equal to two Q velocity V over M. Okay. So what I could do is I could take this guy here and say that, let's have a look, velocity V is equal to Q over M times R B and down here uh, and so that means that that gives me that velocity v squared equals q over m squared r squared b squared and down here of course i have that velocity squared equals 2q v over m so 2q voltage over mass is equal to q over m squared r squared b squared hmm they cancel don't they that q over m cancels out one of those guys so 2 times velocity is equal to Q over M R squared B squared. And so Q over M can be found. But let's think. Am I going to get an equation where Q over M equals something? and then just substitute numbers in like I would do in a math class? Or am I going to think like a physics or an engineer? And am I going to try and work out a method of calculating Q over M and knowing that the answer is correct? And with due respect to my, you know, substitute in friends, it's better to be a little bit careful here and use a more sophisticated uh, uh, experimental method. So I'm going to say, okay, I know that 2 times the velocity is equal to Q over M times R squared B squared. And I'm going to remember that engineers and physicists, they tend to like to get graphs of things and they like the thing they're looking for to be part of the slope and they like um, the slope to be of a straight line. Why? Well, you can tell a straight line very easily. A curvy line, it's hard to tell the difference between a, 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 a um, x squared and an x cubed and all that kind of stuff over short distances so so yeah it's a straight line is great and so we linearize the relationship 
And if it is supposed to be a straight line that goes through the origin, and it doesn't go through the origin, but it's still a straight line, I know one of my measurement instruments needs recalibrating because it's got a DC offset, and that's experimentally really useful. But my answer for my slope will still be correct. And if it isn't a straight line, if it's clearly some kind of curve, then I know that I have a problem with my basic equation. Something's not right. I'm not doing what I think I'm doing. And if it is a straight line and it goes through the origin and it's it's doing that, showing that over a range of values, I can turn around and say the answer that I'm looking for is 12 over this range of values. So it makes a, it's much more sophisticated than plugging numbers in. If I plug numbers into an equation and I have a DC offset, I won't know. I'll get the wrong answer, completely the wrong answer. And I won't be able to say anything other than I think the answer is 12 under these very specific conditions. And I'm not even sure my equation is behaving properly. It's very, very, very naive kind of analysis. So I need to plot some things that give me a straight line. And I want Q over M to be part of the slope. It's in the middle of my graph at the moment, in the middle of my equation at the moment, which is a good thing. I have two choices. I can mess with my B or I can mess with my uh, uh, R, uh, uh, my V. I can't mess with my R. My R is what I read. Um, and on different days, we do this in a different way. Um, the one thing I'd say is that B, you're going to have to calculate. So it's a nice to kind of calculate it once for the experiment and leave it alone. So I'm going to do a little bit of rearranging here. I'm going to, so I'm going to get a graph which is relating the voltage to the radius that I measure. Now, this is lending itself to having V equals something, but the voltage is going to be the independent variable and by tradition we put that horizontally and that means I want to have my R or R squared in this case vertically so I'm going to need to rearrange this so I'm going to say R squared is equal to 2 and over B and then let's just leave this Q over M by itself. Just, just don't, don't flip it. Just, just put it on the bottom like that. So, okay. Um, I'm going to have R squared, say. I could have R squared as the vertical axis. And then that would equal, let's get all our uh, um, unchanging things, constant things together. Oops, the daisy. Uh, no, <laughs> I'm going to erase that. So that's going to be uh, 2 over B squared Q over M times V. This is like Y is equal to M X plus B. Um, so my slope is equal to 2 over b squared q over m so that means that q over m is equal to well it's going to be 2 over b squared slope so what i got to do is i got to plot out a graph of R squared versus V voltage. Get that slope. I've got to work out what my magnetic field strength is and then see what my answer comes out to be like. Um, so let's have a look at what our magnetic field strength is. Let's have magnetic field strength calculation that's the nice thing about lab books we can just 
you know, take a page and do what we like with that. And I hope you remember that the magnetic field for a solenoid is equal to mu naught n over l times i. But we're not dealing with a solenoid. The magnetic field for a Helmholtz pair is equal to, and it's a bit more complicated, it's 8 mu naught times n times i over a times the square root of 125. And that's delivered by the manufacturer and um, <laughs> it comes out of some math somewhere. What does n stand for? n is a number of loops and this equals 132. Oops, 132. And my A is radius of coil. And that equals, uh, it turns out to be 14.75 centimeters on our apparatus. Um, you know, of course, we already said is 4 pi times 10 to the minus 7 Tesla meter per amp. And then we have a current, and my current is equal to Um, 1.5 amps. So, lab partner, do me that calculation and let's compare when we've done it to see if you have the right answers. I want to see in your book, I want to see the working. So, I'm going to sit down, put your calc here and I'll check to see if you've done it partner this is not a one-man lab team you have got to do your calculations here I'm gonna put it on pause and then I'll give you the right answer so that we both know we're on the same page and I'm getting 0 0.00 120703 oh, oh, Tesla and that would be 1.2 times 10 to the minus 3 Tesla or 1.2 milli Tesla whichever one of those you like I guess I like this one if you are getting numbers that are slightly different then just check your calculator if you're getting numbers that are factors of 10 different that's usually a, a a power problem and the most common problem is people they just keep forgetting about using SI units and so they put in 14.75 for a when they should put in 0 0.1475 so make sure you didn't mess up on that but you should have this number we we gonna dial in 1.5 amps into our machine and when we dial in 1.5 amps to our machine we set up this magnetic field this is equal to our B and we're not going to change that for all the experiment we're just going to leave it for the experiment so let's now look in terms of our data table and a good data table so this is data table one a well laid out data table will really will really help you so what do I need to write down I need to write down what I measure so the first thing is going to be my trial 
I never used to bother with trial numbers, but then one time I was trying to reference a data point and it would just have been so much easier if I could have said, look at trial seven, but I hadn't. And it was like a bit of a bit of a pain writing out to tell the people which one I wanted them to look at. So after that, I started putting down the trial number. And this is going to be one, two, three, four, five, six, you know, however many we have. And then, of course, I'm going to set my voltage. So I'm going to set my voltage and this is going to be in volts. Now, I'm plotting V versus R squared, so I don't need to do much with that. I'm going to measure a diameter. The ruler gives me the diameter. So I'm going to get a measurement for each one of these voltages of D, which is going to be in centimeters. Now, I really believe we need to write down what we see. Don't do conversions in your head. Because if you do a conversion in your head and you're wrong, your lab book does not contain the right answer. If you write down what you see and then you do a conversion incorrectly, you can go back and correct the mistake. So write down what you see. It's in centimeters, write it down in centimeters. But I don't want diameter, of course. I want radius. So I'm going to put radius in centimeters. Now, that's fair enough, but I really need to be in, oops a daisy, <laughs> I really need to be in radius in meters. Again, write it down, radius in meters. And then from my graphing point of view, I need to be in radius squared, which will have units of meters squared. Now forgive me, I'm gonna I'm drawing this freehand. You'll use a ruler, of course, but my lines might not be so good. People then ask, it's one of those teacher things where you go back to the office and you go, man, they asked me again, how many data points must I take? And the other teachers go, oh man. Because the answer is you take as many as you need to take to answer the question you want to answer. And at some point, you're going to be the person deciding that, not me. And so I'm always reluctant to give a pat answer to that, to that question. It always seems to me a little bit of a... Um, it's a little bit of a dead end question. Now, truthfully, if you were doing this professionally, what you'd do is you would take your apparatus to the most extreme conditions. Say the biggest voltage that will give you the biggest diameter, which gives you the biggest radius, etc. And you say, I'm never going to go to a higher voltage than this, and I'm never going to get a bigger radius than that. And then what you do is you make your graph. And then you start putting your data points in as you collect data. And what that does is that means that you don't need to, um, you, can, you can see blank places in the, in the data where you need to fill in. It's a really nice way. What we tend to do is we do a, a number of data points. We hope there's enough. We then plot our graph. And I suppose we could go back and collect more data points if we needed, but by and large, we let things slide. I'm looking back at this student's old lab book and they did, they did eight trials. Now, I want to point something out on this apparatus and that is that it's very hard to look at a ruler that's made out of glass and divide your centimeters or half centimeters into millimeters. So rather than setting a voltage and saying, what radius do I have or what diameter do I have? I'm actually going to look at the diameters and tune the beam until it makes the two centimeter 
mark glow and tune it until it makes the three centimeter mark glow and tune it until it makes the five centimeter mark glow. So that's how I'm going to do my data. So let's have a look. So what we did in this group is we went to the uh, diameter and we got 10 centimeters for our first trial. And then they did nine centimeters for their second trial. And they did 8.5 centimeters for the third trial and then eight and then 7.5 and then seven and then six <laughs> and then five and they could have done a whole bunch more they could have done the halves 9.5 etc so i didn't take as much data as i wish they'd taken and then secondly it's never a good idea to take your data in order like this always bounce around because if there's something that's changing with time and you're steadily working through your data you will see the effect and then finally there's no repeat which is a bit disappointing so you know, I'd like there to be a repeat. Go back and do eight and see if you get the same numbers. And so the uh, voltage was 322 volts and 263 volts and 229 volts and 203 volts and 184 volts and I think that's 150 and then 124 and this is going to be 95 so let's see if this makes sense as the voltage gets bigger the diameter is getting bigger and that makes sense so the rest is um, just math. So work out your math and fill in this table, please. And then um, I'll meet you again when we're going to uh, uh, plot out some data, okay? So I'm back and we've uh, filled out our table. Hopefully you've got similar numbers. And I wanna just talk a little bit about about it's getting ready for the graph and the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to turn around and say well I'm plotting that vertically because it's my independent variable and I'm plotting this horizontally because it's my dependent variable and this is going to go from 0 to 350 you know give myself some space and on this side this is going to go zero two and i'm going to do something a bit here weird now i'm going to go 25 i'm going to go times 10 to the minus make that bigger 10 to 5 10 to the minus 4. it's not i'm not going to do particular I'm not, I'm not doing math yet i'm just going to go from zero to 25 and then figure stuff out go from zero to really 35 and figure stuff out. So next we have to go and get some graph paper and I don't have any. So I'm gonna talk you through this. So you can put your page horizontal or vertical, it doesn't matter, it's gotta be a full page. And you go three units up from the bottom and you draw yourself a beautiful line and you go three divisions in from the side and you draw yourself a beautiful line. And then you say, my voltage goes at the bottom and it goes from zero. And we said to something like 350, we'll call it 35. So in my mind, I'm calling it 35. So I count squares. I go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, 34, 35. And as long as I'm over halfway across the page, I'm happy. If I'm less, then I might use two little squares. If I'm a lot less, I'm never going to use three little squares. So I can do one little square, 
for each division two little squares for each division four little squares for each division five little squares would be better never six never seven maybe eight little squares never nine maybe ten little squares because in the end you're going to be a math on this thing and if you have seven little squares to one division it's going to be a disaster so i'm going to pretend i can see squares i'm going to go one two three four make my five look nice six seven eight nine make my ten look bigger one two three four make my five look there six seven eight nine make my ten look bigger one two three four make that one look nice not so big six seven six seven eight nine ten that one's bigger so i'm gonna go uh, not ten but because uh, we're going up to 350 that's going to be a hundred that's going to be 200 that's going to be 300 one two three four five and i just made it and it just doesn't matter by chance from this v squared my biggest number is what 25 i said 2.5 so again i do the same thing i count squares and if i count to 25 and i'm half or halfway i'm i'm fine if it's way down here i've got to do a bigger division if it's way too much i've got to play with it some more so I'm going to say, okay, I'm going to go, uh, and actually my original numbers, well, it doesn't matter what my initial numbers were, I can do whatever I like on it. So this is going to be uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty. 21, 22, 23, 24, 25. You don't have to write in every single value. You do have to tell me though that this is R squared, which is gonna be in meters squared. And I'm squinting over here to see the actual values. Oh, 10, 10 to the minus four. These are times 10 to the minus four. I made them from 2.5 to 25. By multiplying by them by 10, I've got to reduce that by a factor of 10. These are my units, the meter squared. Yeah. Okay, so next, make sure you got your graph. This is graph one. And this is, if nothing else, put down R squared versus the voltage. And then I want you to draw your graph, and I'm going to draw my graph. So here I am, and I've traced up all the values of V, and I've put the corresponding values of R squared, and now I'm putting point protectors. Remember with point protectors, we make them clearly not smudges on the page we make them stand out and we're proud of them we want people to see them because a couple of reasons one is that if people can see them they can see exactly what we did and it's more convincing this is all about persuasion so there's my my graph it looks reasonably straight this is just me doing it by hand i'm going to do it on a piece of true graph paper in a minute but I can already see that there's several possible slopes I can get out of this. Again, ignore the, ignore the origin. It's not a real data point. But I can see, I would put a ruler down, and I can see that there's one line that runs like that. And then I can see that there's oh it's another line that kind of runs like that and my aim is to get two slopes out of that 
the steepest slope will give me one extreme of a reasonable value for the slope and the other slope will give me the other extreme. So that's where I'm at now. So on your graph paper, get a ruler and draw this in. Some of you will be conservative and you'll draw very wide, a very wide cone and others will be less conservative and be um, a narrower cone. That's your personality. What you do is you pick points, like you say, there's a good point, and you say, there is a good point. You're looking for where the cross lines, the hatch lines of the, <laughs> I've got the wrong lines, yeah. You're looking to see where the hatch lines of this cross the hash lines of that. And then you draw yourself a nice triangle. And you work out your rise over your run. And then for the other one, again, you pick convenient points. Uh, let's do this one in gray or whatever. I pick two more sets of points, easily nice convenient points based on where they cross. And I do my run and my rise. So that's your job next. Plot this graph and get me those two slopes. So here we are, and this is my piece of paper. So hopefully you've got something that looks similar. And uh, let me just point some things out to you. Um, okay, so I put my value with my units, and I put my value with my units, and this is a 10 to the minus four, so I also put that in. The idea is I want to work with numbers that I'm comfortable with, so zero to 350 I'm comfortable with. But I don't want to write down times 10 to the minus 4 each time. So I said five, 0 to 25 times 10 to the minus 4. And look at my data points. My data points look pretty nice. And then there's something happened here. And then pretty nice. If I had more time, I would have gone back and uh, rechecked in this area there. But the data is the data. And then what I did was I approached from underneath and got the best line I could and then I approached from above and got the best line I could and um, there we have it it's like I got two bits I'm a little bit conservative so you could argue and say man you could have made that a bit narrower but I'm happy with the way it is um, so I got my two decent lines and then what I do and this is important then what I do is I look for a point where the line I'm interested in crosses the grid beautifully so that I know this is 140 because it's right on the line and I know that this is 310 because it's right on the line and I know that this is 10 because it's right on the line and I know that this guy here is 24 because it's right on the line and I write those numbers down because I want to make life easy for me. And then I work out the actual rise and the run. If you skip steps on that, you're saving time in the short run, but you get confused later. And then I do the same thing on this other line. And then this is a working document, so I put down my highest reasonable slope is the rise over the run of the steep line, which is that, and I work out its value. I start doing some calculations here. So and what we said was we said that Q over M was equal to two divided by B squared and the slope. And we said we did, we calculated it earlier, that B was equal to 1.2 times 10 to the minus 3 Tesla. 
So I know that my highest reasonable Q over M is 2 over B squared. There's only one value for B times my lowest reasonable slope. Do you see that? Because slope's on the bottom. And my lowest reasonable Q over M is equal to 2 over B squared times my highest reasonable slope. So don't need to keep this, I'm just showing you. What were the slope values? So my highest reasonable slope, looking back at that previous page, for me, not for you, but for me, I got 9.58 times 10 to the minus 6. And that slope, it would be meters squared over volt. And my lowest reasonable slope would equal uh, 8.24 times 10 to the minus 6 meters squared per volt. So my highest reasonable Q over M is equal to 2 over 1.2 times 10 to the minus 3 times uh, I want the lowest reasonable slope 8.24 times 10 to the minus 6 oops, I forgot to square that 1.68 times 10 to the 11 it's going to be coulombs per kilogram and my lowest reasonable Q over M is equal to 2 over 1.2 times 10 to the minus 3. There's my B, you've got to square it. Times, going to be 9.58 times 10 to the minus 6. And I work that out. Get 1.45 times 10 to the 11 coulombs per kilogram. This compares. Is equal to 1.75 1 1.76 actually times 10 to the 11 coulombs per kilogram. Mm. Can you see? I'm just a little bit out. Now, I said this is the highest reasonable. Beyond that is unreasonable. This is the lowest reasonable. Below this is unreasonable. And I'm a little bit low. You know, I wish my... Wish my lowest reasonable slope had been a bit shallower <laughs> but it wasn't <laughs> well that's that's the way the that's the way the world works i need to be able to show this well so we're going to do a comparison diagram so comparison diagram Hopefully your numbers were slightly better than mine, but you never know. 4 or times 10 to the 11. 1 1.5, 1 1.6, 1 1.7, 1 1.8, 1.8 or times 10 to the 11. So a nice linear scale. This is 1.50, 1 1.60, 1 1.70. And you'd be doing this with a ruler, of course. I'm working kind of on my knee. It's not quite, but I'm, I'm kind of on my knee. And this is experiment. And my experimental values ranged between 
1.45, which is there, and 1.68, which is there. So I like to show these like that. So that's the range. It shouldn't be less than 1.45 times 10 to the 11, and it shouldn't be more than 1.76. Oh, 1.76, I'm sorry. Uh, sorry, 1.6, 1.68 times 10 to the 11. And there's the issue, the accepted value. So this is accepted. Accepted value is there. So to that extent, I'm not in agreement. My data does not, is not consistent with the theory. And so if this was an important issue, I'd need to go back and I'd need to do some more work. I'd need to basically um, probably collect more data or basically check, check through my work. Um, don't be disheartened if your accepted value does not match your experimental value. Think of it this way. You don't get, you don't get, you don't get um, uh, Nobel prizes for agreeing with the accepted value. You get Nobel prizes for finding a circumstance in which the accepted value is not correct, and working out why. So whenever you get something like this where it's it's not in agreement, it's actually from a personal point of view a time of, of excitement. It could be maybe you've discovered something different. Um, so, so get rid of that attitude of the right answer. The right answer is what you get. Now, does it agree or not? That's another issue. Don't get tempted to change the data to make it agree with the accepted value. That's a real mistake. Need to do a comparison diagram. Last little bit conclusion. The conclusion should be as short and as succinct as possible. The experimental value for the um, Q over M of an electron was what do we say? 1.45 times 10 to the 11 coulombs per kilogram to 1.68 times 10 to the 11 coulombs per kilogram. Can you see how using the reasonable outer limit method of writing down your answer really makes it defined? And this is not consistent with the accepted value. This is for my results. Your results might be different. Of 1.76 times 10 to the 11 coulombs per kilogram. And that's, that's the way it works. That's just the way the thing works. So there we have it. It's a bit long lab. You're doing something very fundamental. It's a really, it's a phenomenal lab. You're doing something really quite interesting. And the, even with these numbers, you know, they're not bad. It's like, it's, 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 it's not a terrible result. You're right in that order of magnitude. You're just a little bit out on my numbers. And that's, you know, I was a bit reckless in the way I drew the line, perhaps, or, you know, something. So there we have it. And uh, um, write up what I've told you to write up. Put your numbers in, please. And um, um, see you next week.